And I will sound like me again. Praise God. So tonight, by the grace of God, we're going to pray some more. Because when Alan was praying just now, he was calling out a couple of things. And I was praying, but I was smiling at the same time because of the fact that, um, you know, sometimes when you are called to the prophetic, and I'm speaking to every one of us in here, you need to learn the art of playing catch-up. Because a lot of what God reveals are things that are about to be unveiled. If it's already known, if everyone's already seen it, then it's not much of a warning, it's not much of a, of a service to others. So if you have a watchman that is on a tower that is supposed to be looking out for the people within the city, he has to be able to see things before they come. And so when you see things before they come, there are times wherein you begin to lose track of which, what has happened, what is happening, and what is about to happen. You know, there was a time in the ministry of Paul that Paul got to that point, and he was like, I know a man who either in the body or outside of the body, to be honest, I cannot tell. So when things happen, in that regard, one of what it looks like is what we are experiencing right now. About two meetings ago, the word of the Lord came forth from the book of Jeremiah. We read the book of Jeremiah. We read Jeremiah eleven seven. We read Jeremiah eleven seventeen, And we also read Jeremiah eleven twenty one. And what we read in Jeremiah eleven twenty one is what we're... What, what we have been experiencing without necessarily thinking about it, at least speaking for myself, but now we're seeing it play out. So that is where we're going to kick off from today, and we will do uh, some more praying. And, and then I would love to encourage us to not stop the prayer here, to carry the prayer on. Many of people need that prayer today than ever before. So let me, let me explain a little further. What the enemy is looking to do is the enemy is looking, and when I say the enemy, I, I don't want you to think that, oh man, must there always be an enemy? Why do we talk about an enemy all the time? Can we just be ordinary people? It's too late for us to be ordinary people. It's too late. I mean, I don't know what movies y'all have been watching, but... It's too late for us to wish that there is no war. We were born into warfare. You know, the battle for this, for this earth, the battle for the souls of man, I mean, it's like a never-ending battle. You understand what I mean? It is like a never-ending battle. And so, um, Emmanuel, may I just crave your indulgence once we fine-tune this one? Can I have you on the drums for just two more minutes? We're going to pray. You can still stay if you don't mind. Just two minutes. We're going to pray. But I want us to have the drums in our ears as we pray. Uh, simply because there are certain things that have just been designed by God to function in certain ways. And having music when it comes to prophetic declarations is not just something that I invented or something that... You know, we just like because it sounds good and it gives us goosebumps. No, it is in fact because the Lord commands it. The Bible says to praise the Lord with all manners of musical instruments. To praise him with a harp, with a cymbal, you know, with the percussion instruments. And so at this time, it's going to be, a, it, this is a charge to pray a prayer of warfare. And so let me go back to what I was saying that the enemy wants a situation wherein he doesn't completely and highly hate humanity. He wants to convert people into zombie soldiers. People who are not thinking for themselves. Remember we talked about that last week when God himself was speaking saying, I have seen your heart and I am not there because you're not even thinking. You're not meditating. You're not using that, blow, that amazing tool that I've given to you, the mind. And so... That's what the enemy is looking to do. And in order for Satan and his cohorts 
to be able to surprise those who are in the city, he has to take out the watchmen. Because when you don't see them coming and they manage to infiltrate the gates, many people within the city will not be able to tell apart who is good or evil. So that is the reason why the watchmen have to be able to say, you see those guys? They're not from here. They're trying to blend in. They're trying to take us from the inside. And so the enemy is targeting the watchmen. So let's go to that Jeremiah eleven twenty-one 21 again. And with that, we will pray. Because when Alan was standing here and declaring that there is no divination against the men of God, neither is there an enchantment against the servant of the Lord. Many of us may think it's yet another scripture from the book of Numbers. Yes, it is a scripture from the book of Numbers. But the reality of it is this. It isn't just a, a scripture for us to recite because we memorized it. But the reality of it is that is the proclamation that we need to make in the times that we're in. Because there is indeed an arsenal of opposition. Look at what it says. Therefore, says the Lord, concerning the men of Anathoth who seek your life, saying, do not prophesy in the name of the Lord, lest you die by our hand. They want us to shush. They do not want us to prophesy. And I'm, I'm not just talking about your neighbor. I'm not just talking about your cousin that you no longer talk to, that doesn't talk to you. I'm talking about the fact that there are principalities and powers and there are elements and instruments within the spiritual realm that consider our prophecy a nuisance because it's getting in the way of their business. They have to carry out their assignment just, like, just as you have to carry out your assignment. And so if we can be immobilized and paralyzed, it makes their work easy. And it's not going to happen, not on my watch. Praise the Lord. And so it says, they want to stop you from prophesying and they are threatening. But the word of the Lord to you and I today is this, we cannot be shut up. We will no longer even tolerate distraction. I'm talking about the fact that now we are renewing our focus and it's going to be a laser focus. So if you would rise with me and declare with all boldness and with all commitment to the Lord, saying it doesn't matter what it is, I will stand my ground. No matter what it is, I will not leave my place. No matter what the enemy throws at me, the watchtower will not be vacant. But I will continue to set my gaze upon the horizon so that I can alert and warn my brothers and sisters in the city concerning what is coming. There is no divination against Jacob. Neither is there enchantment against Israel. The Lord is with us. And because we know that we are confident to remain standing, even in the face of opposition, in the face of the storm, it doesn't matter how much delay I may have experienced. One thing that I do know that it has been forbidden by God that I be denied. I may be delayed, but I will not be denied. Even that which looks like a delay is part of heaven's strategy to get me more ready than ready. That which looks like a delay is part of heaven's strategy to make sure that all of my enemies are gathered in one place so that with one blow, I will see them fall like the armies of Philistine. I thank you, Lord, because that which looks like delay is a divine strategy to make sure that my cup gets full and it runs over. That which looks like a delay is intended by God to make my situation more beautiful. That looks like a delay is intended by God to ensure that all the hosts of heaven that need to have gone ahead of me have gone ahead of me. That which looks like a delay is heaven's packaging of a blessing that generations will talk about. That which looks like a delay, it is God preparing my heart in maturity to be able to appreciate, to be able to celebrate, and to be able to accommodate the great and marvelous things that he has for me in glory. Hallelujah! Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, come on. I want to say that again because that which looks like a delay is actually heaven's strategy for making sure 
that all the I's are dotted and all the T's are crossed. <laughs> because the Bible says God makes everything beautiful in its time. Communion house, God bless you. Be seated. Hallelujah. Thank you, guys. I appreciate that greatly. Yesterday, I called one of our banks, the principal bank that we use for our business. And I called them because I, I feel like they've not been doing as well as we thought with some of our credit lines. And I was like, okay, I mean, we're running a business here. What is going on? Why, why aren't we seeing performance? I mean, of course, I know what's in the news. I know what people have been saying about the economy and how the banks themselves. I mean, the other day, somebody said they wanted to get some money from the bank. And the bank was like, sorry, we don't have that kind of cash. You see what I mean? That is the economy of today. But we are not moved by all of those things because God did not promise to supply all your needs according to the central bank or according to the inland or federal reserve. It says according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You know what? Praise the Lord. But every now and again, you need to shake people up. And so I shook them up and they were telling me all the usual stories. Well, this is because of that. This is this and that. I'm like, okay, forget about you. And I went to another bank. And I went to the other bank and I was like, I need this particular kind of instrument because, you know, it's easier for me to be able to send money to people. We've got people working overseas and all whatnot. And they were like, uh, we don't do that. I'm like, apparently there's a reason why those ones are being funny because they know they're the only ones doing what we need in totality. So I left the place. I was a little disgruntled. And I didn't hear the Lord say anything to me in particular about what was going on. So I just carried on. And then when I got home, the Lord reminded me that the house needed some attention. There were cobwebs all over the place because when you live in a tree house, you and spiders struggle for the space. You see what I mean? I wish the spiders were that committed, you know, so that they can struggle and say sometimes they want to pay the power bill. They want to be the first to pay the power bill. You know about them spiders, they don't help with anything but just create work for me. And... So I was there, and I, as I was doing it, one of the things that you do when you're dusting cobwebs is that you look up. And so when I looked up, I was like, wait, 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 wait a minute. This was in there yesterday. This was in there yesterday. How come it's there now? And the Holy Spirit said to me, is it the same place? I said, yes. He said, but it's now in a different state. I said, okay, you know, when the Lord comes to you like that, he gets your attention. You know that there's a lesson that's about to unfold. So he said to me, he said, where is heaven? I was like, um, now I think I know what you're saying. We always ask the question, where is this? Where is that? However, you know, there are times where a more appropriate question is, am I able to hear myself a little more? Maybe turn this thing to myself or something like that? Because I feel like I am not being heard, but I, it might just be me who is not hearing me. Can you all hear me, though? Oh, yeah. And then a little deeper, if you can. God is good. Hazel, good to see you. Yeah, great things are about. I think you are one of those people who's experienced delay. But then it's not because you're about to be denied. It's because the Lord is packaging. You know, God, God is good. Praise the Lord. Alrighty, ooh, that's more like it. God is good. And nobody's sleeping now. Once I notice you're dozing off, I just move closer to the mic. Praise God. So the question sometimes is not where, the question is when. You know that Lawrenceville, this town, is not likely to get up one day and say, I'm tired of being here in Gwinnett County. I'm just going to uproot myself and go to Forsyth because it's fixed so it doesn't move. But if we allow enough passage of time, a lot of what Lawrenceville wants to go and become in Forsyth, it can become here. You've heard the song that says heaven is a place on earth. This earth is not going anywhere. But what it will become is a function of time, not a function of its location. 
I know in real estate they tell you location, 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 location. That is somewhat true, but that is not an absolute truth. You see, because those folks in Manhattan who were shouting, location, 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 if you take them back 400 years, what is that location? No value. But it's still the same location. So is it really location or timing? Because when Jesus was to reveal his ministry or to begin his ministry, John the Baptist says that the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is coming, but we did not see the streets of gold suddenly come down and overshadow the ground. There was no spacecraft or saucer that flew down to the earth and said, oh, now the kingdom of God is come. But when he said the kingdom of God was coming, it came and it was the same earth. The same location. But pain started to go away. Death started to go away. Abundance started to become the order of the day. All of what people wanted heaven for started to happen on the earth because the time of one man came. And when you look at what Jesus said as he taught his disciples how to pray, he says, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He said, thy kingdom come. And so that heaven is coming to earth and Jesus made sure of letting us know when he was describing to John what will become of the earth. He says, I am coming and I make all things new and I will wipe away every tear from your eye. Do you know when he was talking about the fact that no sorrow will be in their hearts and no memory of loss will remain in their minds? He was talking about the people that will inherit the earth, but he gave a description of a heavenly experience. And Account after account, the Lord started to reveal to me that I have not truly been operating with a mindfulness of time as much as I should. I've been focused more on locations and places. Maybe if we move from here to there, maybe if I move that account from here to there. And the Lord said to me, he says, when the time comes, the same place will abound with goodness. The good news and the joy of that revelation is in the fact that I don't have to become another person. I just have to learn how to wait for another time. <laughs> you know, one is easier than the other. Imagine if I'm still focused on location. Or imagine if one is focused on location and you've sown in this land and you've planted in this land and nothing's come out of it. What do you do? You take off and you go plant somewhere else. And you take off and you go plant somewhere else and you keep moving about going to and fro. One of the ways by which a person becomes bankrupt the quickest is by moving to and fro without being established anywhere. The Bible says, look at the ant, you sluggard. Go and learn from the diligence of the insects. Insects, you who keep giving your eyes to slumber and sleep to your eyelids. He says, if you're not careful, your poverty will come. As the poverty of who? The one that travels. I mean, these days people travel and they make a lot of money because that's not the kind of traveling the Bible is talking about when you go consulting and you're traveling from place to place. Your feet and you're behind maybe sitting on different airplanes, but the reality of it is that your assignment is still planted in the same establishment, the same organization, the same practice. So back in the day, people who traveled all the time, they were never present enough in one place to plant and to reap what they have planted. You know, there are certain times that you plant and you don't reap because the ground is not ready for you and you have to turn it over again and leave it fallow for a little while and come back to it. It takes being grounded, being established to be able to achieve the kind of fruitfulness that God promises. So when the Holy Spirit ministered that to me, it occurred to me that many times what we do is we keep leaving our place, whereas in fact we just need to stay in the same place and wait for the time that God has promised to make everything beautiful. Some of you, you don't need to stop reading that translation of the Bible. You don't need to leave that place. You just need to keep on keeping on until the time of insight comes. 
You know, many of us, we know relationships that we shouldn't have left, but we left simply because we thought the problem was, the problem was with that place without knowing that the problem was just because the time of the things that we are seeing has yet to come. The Lord would have us take a stand. And that stand is to stand. The Bible says, having done all to stand. He didn't say run. He didn't say move. He said, having done all to stand, stand ye therefore. We need to become people who know how to have a resolution and to stand by the resolution regardless of the experiences that we have, regardless of the fleeting seasons, regardless of the cloud. We need to be able to stand. So when all of that was done to me yesterday, I said, okay, I get that from the perspective of a businessman. I get that from the perspective of an investor. I said, but Lord, I know that you usually have a balanced theology for me. How does that affect my ministry? And the Lord said to me, you are a watchman on the tower. And the enemy wants you to relocate and go somewhere else. He says, I'm telling you that you are in the right place. Just stay there until the right time comes. Praise the Lord. I am going to stay here until the right time comes. You know, people say things like, oh, maybe you'd have more people interested and listen to your messages if you would just leave this God, Jesus is coming message and move to something else. And that's because that was what they did and it worked for them. But the question is, you think it's working for you until you see what God intended for you. There are many people with millions of followers and God intends for them to have disciples. But they have followers. I mean, Jesus had 4,000 followers at some point, but only 12 were disciples. Many people, God intends for them to build a home, to be an example to other believers. But what they have done is they have built a ministry. And they are patting themselves on the back, glorying in their own abilities and in the wonders of their talents and gifting. Whereas their heavenly father is like, uh, yeah, that's a big waste. Because that was not what we had in mind for you. Because we must never forget that we did not make ourselves. And the one who made you, he, know, he knows the purpose for having made you. And that is the only thing that he is willing to compliment and to commend at the end of the day. If God made you to be one that serves cold water to the thirsty soul and you decided to go set up a podium somewhere all in the name of doing a crusade and gathering thousands of people, even healing the sick and raising the dead. When you get to the gates or when you get to the day of judgment, look at what Jesus said about those guys who came boasting. They said, oh, but we did miracles in your name. Jesus is not saying, you're lying. You didn't do any miracles. No, that was not the problem. They did miracles in his name. Because to do a miracle in Jesus' name, there's only one requirement. You have to be a believer. Because the Bible says, these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. So these were believers who went astray simply because they could not wait for the timing of the Lord. Neither were they content with godliness. The, the Bible says, godliness with contentment is great gain. And what did they do? They went to do that which their own souls approved of as opposed to what the Lord approved of. And right in their faces, the Lord ushered into glory the ones who put clothes on the back of the naked, the ones who give cold water to the thirsty, and the ones that mended the broken. And Jesus was like, this is, that was all that was required. You're doing too much. Martha, Martha, why are you philandering? Why are you faffing about from place to place? Why are you going to and fro? Satan is quite good at doing what he's supposed to do. You don't have to take his ministry. He's the one that goes to and fro. You be like Mary. Jesus says, but look at Mary. She has chosen the good part. And what was she doing? She was just waiting. 
as watchmen in the times that we're in. The enemy is targeting us because he wants to get us down from the watchtower so that himself and his cohorts can spring a surprise. Now, the Lord said to me to remind you that some of the people that will be coming into the city are people who are, who are in fact, human beings. They're natural people. Some of them born in the same household as you. But the reality of it is that the enemy has taken them out to his camp. He has re-engineered their thinking. He has taken out any kind of link that they have to purpose. And he has given them another assignment. So that he can introduce them back to the population as part of the great deception. And that is the reason why we can no longer regard anyone according to the flesh. Paul says, henceforth know we no one after the flesh. Jesus says, when his siblings came to knock the door of the place where he was preaching, Jesus was teaching at a house church, at a house meeting, and his siblings, even his mom, Mary, was there. They came, Mary, James, Jose, or whatever he's called, and Salome, they were outside with Mary, the mother of Jesus. And they were like, they told the ushers, tell him to come out. His family is here. Jesus' mother, come on. I mean, Jesus' mother was someone that the heavenly father found worthy to have sent a message through Gabriel to say to her, the Lord said, tell that woman, she is blessed of all women. Someone who had received such a holy commendation who was the one who raised the boy that became king? She stood outside and said, I want to see my boy. And the brothers and the sister were like, yeah. He left home without doing the dishes. Who does he think he is? We're raising money in the neighborhood to make a new drainage. And he's just been avoiding us. Who does he think he is? They must have had some legitimate reason to have not been able to wait for the meeting to finish. Although Jesus preached long messages, so I don't blame them. Just like someone trying to wait for me for the message to finish. So to be honest, they may have waited for like a whole day and Jesus wasn't turning up. So they had to barge in. They said, let him come out. And you know what Jesus' response was? Jesus says, who is my family? Who are my brothers? Who are my sisters? And who in fact is my mother? And the people were like those folks at the door. And Jesus was like, now nah, you're mistaken. He says, you are my family. He says, the ones that do the will of my father. They are my brothers, they are my sisters, and they are my mothers. Jesus laid the foundation for the sake of this final generation. And you know why that is? Because he knows a time of great deception was coming. And that was why he says, don't be drunk with the wine of their carousing, simply because this deception is gonna be extremely subtle. And Jesus told us to watch and to pray. So we cannot afford to say because this was the person who led me to the Lord. I got saved under his ministry. He baptized me in water. So whatever he says is going on now has to be what is going on. No, no, no. It, don't, it doesn't matter anymore because the number of people that have been taken over by hell are just way too many. There are too many people for us to now gamble with our relationships and affinities. We need to examine the fruits because Jesus says a time is coming that many will come in my name, but by their fruits you shall know them. We're going to know them by their fruits. And if not for the fruits, we're not just going to assume that they are one of us. We would always ask the question, are you for us or are you against us? All of that is going to take place in the city, but watchmen are positioned upon the watchtower to make it easier for the people to be able to overcome the deception by having us watchmen able to see ahead of time what is coming and to call it out and to call it out and to expose it. So Satan knows that we need to be taken out because if we remain the great deception cannot be effective against the election. Those who are of the election will not be deceived. 
Paul said it. He prophesied in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He says, I don't even need to tell you about the great day of the Lord. He says, because it will come upon others as a thief in the night, but not you, because you will know your season. But you know what? Prophecy is script writing. You have to choose what part of prophecy you fulfill. Some people have chosen to not be in fellowship, even though they know the day is approaching. When the Bible says, do not forsake the gathering together of yourselves, especially as you see the day approaching. They have chosen not to be in fellowship because the world is more fun than it's ever been. There are more parties than there has, there are more parties and more places to go to than ever before. So we need to ration our time and see if we can make church once every two months. They have already made their choice. And so if you find such people wallowing in deception, you cannot give them any of your oil because they make their choice. But for those of us who are here, we know the reason why we are here. We are here because as we see the day approaching, there are certain things that we need to do to ensure that our vision remains sharp, that our minds remain sober so that we can watch and we can pray in all soberness of mind. Why did Jesus say all of that? Why did he say watch and pray? Why did he say don't be drunk with the wine of their carousing? Simply because he knows that many people will approach us and they will try to sidetrack us. They will tell us, the Lord sent me to you to tell you that you have done enough and that great is your reward. Now it's time for you to leave and go to another place. Tell them, shush. Because they are of the order of the men of Anathoth. They want to stop you from prophesying. They want to preach to you a redirection. Whereas the reality of it is I don't need a redirection. Because I am led by the Holy Spirit. I just need to be able to wait on him without agitation. Many of us get agitated because the flesh is like how long are we going to wait? And then you should tell the flesh as long as it takes. Because the word of God says, he that will come, will come and will not tarry. Wait for him, he will surely come. I wish the Bible had stopped there, but it didn't. The word of God goes on to say, even if he delays, wait for him, he will surely come. He will not delay. So I'm like, okay, the Lord is saying, if he delays, he will not delay. So what that means is, if it looks to you like a delay, as far as we are concerned, the man is on time. As far as we are concerned, the fulfillment is on track. As far as we are concerned, it's not going to be delayed a day earlier, nor will it be delayed or delivered a day later. I want you to bless the Lord in your heart and say, Father, I thank you because I will not be caught on the streets. I will stay behind the doors that has the blood of the Lamb. I'm not about to change location. I'm just about to receive more grace to wait, to be steadfast, to be immovable. I give this illustration many years ago, and it is still as valid today as it was back then. Just imagine, Tia, you ordered a dress from Amazon, and then they said it was going to be delivered on Tuesday. And Tuesday came, you didn't see the dress by 8 a.m., and you were like, well, it is Tuesday. My phone says it's Tuesday. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go look for the dress. And then you leave and you try to go and find the dress. Is it very likely that you find that dress? Because you don't even know where to go. But the reality of it is the flesh working with Satan can convince us that we know where to go. Because somebody told you where they went. And you're like, when this person's dress was delayed... This was where they went to. And then you start going around knocking doors and asking questions. Whereas all you needed to do was wait because there is only one addre address that you supplied. And the address that you supplied is the one you're supposed to wait at. God is expecting to find you in one place and one place alone. And that is the place of faith. It's the place of those who believe. Because the moment you start trying to change institutions, the moment you try to change location, 
what you are saying is that I don't believe this thing is working. Maybe God is running out of whatever he uses to be God. Maybe God is losing his mojo. I need to help him. So I'm going to find a location that makes it easier for God to bless me. But let me tell you something. A lot of the most blessed people that we read about in the Bible, they were not men who lived in forest lands or lived by rivers. They were men who lived in the desert. And the reason why God did that is because God wanted you to know that he doesn't need anything to bless you. He can bless you however, wherever, when the time comes. Praise the Lord. So today we're going to just go ahead and read three scriptures from the book of Philippians chapter 1. And we're going to read actually two from 1 and one from Philippians 3. And once we do that, we will go ahead and break bread. Philippians is right after the, the book of 2 Corinthians. After Ephesians, I mean. Philippians chapter 1. In fact, I want us to start from Philippians chapter 3. We're going to read verse 17 of that. And look at what it says. It says, brethren, Philippians chapter 3 verse 17. It says, brethren, join in, join in following my example. And note that those who so walk, as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have not told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Why? Because whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. Paul says, let me be your example. Not those guys who set their minds on earthly things. I'm going to just go very quickly to Philippians chapter 1. We're going to read two verses. We're going to read verse 2. And we're going to read verse 9. Verse 2 says, grace to you and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Cody. And verse 9 says, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. The reason why Paul said that there is a grace that will abound to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, this is one of those times that he didn't say through the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't say according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He says grace from our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to remind you that the Bible says concerning Jesus when the prophecy came forth by Isaiah, he said unto us a child is born Unto us a son is given. He says, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. And he also will be called, what? He will be called a mighty father. He's going to be called father. So all those people who say, oh, Jesus is not, um, he's not God, you know, because, you know, the, the, he kept referring to the father. But yes, even concerning him also, it will be called the Almighty Father. There is a mystery that we need to tap into when it comes to recognizing that there is grace and peace that comes from the Father and Jesus Christ. And let me tell you what that grace looks like. The Bible says inheritances are given by fathers. But your inheritance in Christ Jesus is called what? A joint inheritance because we are joint heirs together with him. So if fathers give an inheritance 
And your heavenly father said in, 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 in Psalms 82 that he will repossess the earth from the ones who have been running it and then he will give it to the ones that he so pleases. And Jesus comes in Matthew chapter 5 verse 5 and he says, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. What is that telling you? What that is telling me is that there is a connection between the inheritance that the father promised and the inheritance that I get to share in Christ Jesus. And you know what is common about that inheritance? What is common to that inheritance is that that inheritance is the same in heaven as it is on earth. That inheritance that the Father describes is your heavenly inheritance. The Bible says he has blessed you with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. But when Jesus came, he says, now all things are yours. I put it to you folks that the inheritance, the grace of the Father, and the grace of Jesus Christ is simply talking about when the timing aligns between heaven in eternity and the earth where you're at. So when I see Anita, I will see upon Anita the grace of the Father. And I will also see upon her the grace of Christ. Not the grace of the Father through Christ, but the grace of the Father and all of the inheritance that he promised and the grace of the Son and the joint inheritance that you have. Everything will be present in one instance because the time has come. Praise the Lord. How does that apply to me on a daily basis? Every single day that I look into the word of my heavenly father, I look into scriptures. Or I look into notes that I have written of the things that the father has promised to do for me. Every time that I look into those things and I look at where I'm at right now, because every single day I live and move and have my being on the inside of Jesus Christ. If I look at where I'm at and it doesn't align with that which the Father has promised, all I have to tell myself is that I just need to keep holding on. Because it's a function of time. When the time comes, both of them will be in alignment. But guess what? Paul was saying some people have interpreted the strategy of heaven using earthly ways and they have lost their inheritance. He says they were once with us. He says, but now look at their shame. They have walked away. He says, do not be like them. Be like me. The one who has recognized that all I have to do is wait for the one who promised to fulfill what he has said. I'm going to read that verse 9 to us again, Philippians chapter 1 verse 9. It says, and this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and in all discernment. He says, I pray for you that what? That your love may abound. In the last days, the Bible says the love of many will wax cold. Do you know that you do not leave the people that you love? We don't, even if you have to physically be away from them, you're still with them because they are with you. If you travel out of town, you may not physically be with them, but you're more aware of them than the person who sits across to them in the office, across from them in the office, simply because your heart is pinging theirs all the time. You're thinking about them and, you, and they are thinking about you. Because you do not leave the people that you love. Because those you love, you treasure. And where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So as we break bread today, I want us to tap into the secret of staying steadfast. Staying in one place. The secret of remaining until the blessing of the Father and the blessing of the Son. The blessing of eternity and the blessing of time. The blessing that was promised and the blessing that you're experiencing. Until they come into full alignment, there is one thing and one thing alone that can keep you steadfast. And you know what that thing is? The love of the Father. Because if you will love Him you will treasure his presence. If you love him, 
You will not go after anything outside of him and outside of his kingdom because there is nothing for you out there. And Paul says, I pray for you that your love will remain steadfast. Because if your love is not steadfast, your discernment will be shabby. Let me prove that to you real quick. Do you know that there are times when you go out all day, you go shopping, you go to the office, you visit clients, you do all of that, and when you come home, your children or your spouse will look at you and say, what is this thing on your face? And you're like, there's nothing on my face. I've been everywhere today. No one pointed anything out. But they'd be like, no, no, this is it. Let me pop it for you. Now, those other people, when they were looking at you, they didn't see you. They saw the opportunity that you represented. They saw the money that you have come to spend at the shop. They saw the hands that you have brought with which to do their work. All they care about is what they're going to get out of you. But the people who love you, they see you because they focus on you and they look at you with a gaze. So when your love is not steadfast, when you love the things of the world more than you love the things of God, you will keep missing the signs that God is showing you. You will keep missing the things that God has on his face, the expression, the impressions, what he's trying to communicate to you because your discernment is a function of your heart and your love for him. I want you to meditate on those three scriptures. Philippians 1, 2, 1, 9, and Philippians chapter 3, verse 17 that we read. Simply because the Lord is saying you are a watchman on the tower. The enemy knows that as long as you are on the tower with your focus on the horizon, your discernment sharp, the city is safe because you will call out the advances of the enemy. And so what does Satan want to do? Satan and his recruits want to get you distracted. They want to get you coming down. They want you to focus on yourself. They tell you things like, you've been on that tower for too long. Don't you want to come down and take a break? Don't you want to come down and drink some water? Don't you have something to do? In fact, we have been assigned to come and take your place. Take a break for a little bit. If you slack in your love for God, for a second, the enemy can get you to focus on yourself. And that's the end. You leave your place. So what do we do when we are praying for other people? When we are praying and spending time with God, let us learn to prefer others before us. Let us learn to seek what's in the heart of the Father. Let us learn. You see, because when you come into the office of a prophet, or the Lord has called you to be a watchman, the only way to see what's in the mind of the Father is if your vision is clear. But if you go to God all the time and your 17 and a half prayer requests are about you and your conveniences, that is all you're going to hear because everything else that God is saying is just bouncing off your ear. Because that is not what you want to hear. So as watchmen, we need to go to him knowing fully well that his love in our hearts is paramount. And when we do that, guess what's going to happen? We will maintain that position and we will maintain the discernment with which to be able to call out whatever the enemy is planning. So now let me tell you very quickly, and then we're going to break bread. One of the things that the enemy is doing and that is being done using a lot of supernatural power. You see, I told you a while ago that the wind is blowing that the winds are blowing and the winds will come on land, right? Land before the sea, sea before the trees. And that between the land and the trees, we're going to see, I mean, between the, uh, the land and the sea, we're going to see things that will happen just right at the intersection of the land and the sea. Now, many people are unaware of this because they're not paying attention, because they're not where they're supposed to be. But what have we been seeing since then? We have been seeing a lot of Flooding, earthquakes, things that are happening on the land. And still some people think, oh, it's a coincidence. It's always happened, right? Now, this is where the supernatural power comes in. The power that was given to the enemy to deceive the nation is, is simple. It's the power to get people to make conclusions that are based on assumptions. 
And people will conclude every single time, oh, that this is just a natural disaster. They will conclude every single time, don't worry, it's only a question of time. The interest rates will go back to what they were. Oh, we've seen this before. And, you know, people keep talking about all these things because of the fact that if they would wake up to for a moment believe that God is fulfilling that which he has promised, then they may want to examine themselves and say, well, if these things are being fulfilled and what follows is that he is coming and his reward is with him, am I doing my work? Am I working the work of him? When Jesus sighted the darkness, he didn't go into hiding. Jesus saw the darkness from afar. Guess what he did? He sped up his work. They were trying to distract him. They were saying, hey, Jesus, we need to go visit this person. Jesus, we need to go do that. He says, nope, I must work the work of him who has sent me while it is day. He says, because look, I've seen it. The darkness is coming. And when it gets here, no one can work. And so when we see these things, we're not supposed to be running around. We're supposed to remain where he has positioned us, continuing to do that which he has commanded us to do. Don't let the lack of result make you doubt your calling. Let me say that again. Do not let the lack of result make you doubt whether you have heard God or not. Part of the way the Lord raised me was when I was growing up, and it still happens occasionally, even now, I will hear things, and in my heart I will say, yes, this is God. God has spoken to me. And I will go in that direction, and there will be no result. If anything at all, there are instances where the Lord says, I want you to put this money here, I want you to do that. And I do it, and everything goes zap. When I was much younger, I would say definitely that was not God. Because the Bible says that he gives me the power to prosper. It is, it is, I'll be quoting scriptures. But eventually, one day, I just realized that, wait a minute. Some of the things that I thought were losses, when the right time came, they, become, they became gain in such a way that I could not have engineered or strategized. And so I had to repent before the Lord. I said, Father, when this happened, I thought you had left me. But the reality of it was you were more with me than I could have asked for. And so I started to believe more in what he says and the voice of the good shepherd than I believe in the produce or the result that I can see. The profit that you make from a business is temporal. It's either you spend it or you reinvest it, but at some point it's going to have to leave that account and go somewhere else because the Bible says wealth will develop wings and fly away. It is the nature of things. That's why when you have money, they say you are liquid because when it's liquid, it flows. But the reality of it is you need to know the voice of the good shepherd. So we will not be of the company of those people who are using the result of lack of result to determine where the Lord is because the Lord is not in those elements. The Lord is in the place of faith. So as the enemy is getting ready to continue to lead people based on assumptions, getting them to jump to conclusions, your heart will not be deceived. You will see the things that are happening in the light of the word of God and then allow yourself to bring out the sharpest of discernment to be able to tell what the enemy is up to because you already know what your heavenly father is up to. I want to encourage you folks that in the mighty name of Jesus, every single one of us that have been brought here by God will prophesy. We will speak the mind of God without the fear of the men of Anathoth. We will speak the word of God without the fear of being ridiculed and no love will take us out of the place where God has positioned us because our love for God will be unwavering. I pray for you, like Paul said, that your love will abound, that you will choose to be satisfied with the Lord just because you love him so much, you do not want to go seeking for another. I pray for you also that in the mighty name of Jesus, that as the days unfold, you will ask and you will receive. You will seek and you shall find. You will knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Because to him who asks, it shall be given. To him who seeks, and the one who seeks will find. And to him who knocks, the door shall be opened. The Lord would have me say to you that those actions are important. Because while you wait, you're not supposed to just wait without doing something. You're supposed to wait and be diligent while you wait doing these three things. Asking seeking, knocking. Your wait time 
It's not supposed to be a thing of boredom. You're not just waiting for, past to for time to pass. Yes, you're waiting for the right time. But while you wait, you walk the work of him who has sent you. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you because in here today, there is a restoration that is going on wherein you are restoring to us opportunities that we have missed. There are people close to us that we should have spoken the word of God to. There are situations that were very sensitive and crucial that we were supposed to have prophesied in and prophesied over that we haven't. I see the hand of the Lord turning back the dial of time for your sake so that you can insert that prophetic word into those hearts and into those situations. If you want to seize that opportunity today, or better still, if you already know in your heart that you belong in the category of those that will once again have an opportunity to prophesy because you chickened out when they threatened you, you looked at their faces and you were like, I, I, I'm not going to say what I want to say. The Lord is saying, yes, those were the days of ignorance. But I am restoring to you the years the locusts and the canker worm have eaten. I will bring to you again another opportunity to speak my word. Like the Lord gave Samson another opportunity, he will give you another opportunity. However, because you are under the new covenant with better promises, you will not perish with your enemies, but you will live to declare the works of your heavenly father. If such moments have already come to you, I want you to stand up wherever you might be. If such instances have already come to you, I want you to stand up wherever you might be and say, Father, I thank you for bringing this second chance. Some of you is actually like the third or the fourth or maybe even the fifth chance. But the Lord is saying, I'm not giving up on you because you're here. I know you haven't given up on me. And I am bringing it to you again. And we're going to break bread today. Every single one of us. But for those people standing, I have some quick information to share with you. Isaiah walked around for two years naked. Which means many people regarded him as a lunatic. We like to read the book of Isaiah. We, we love the prophecies of Isaiah. We think Isaiah was, a, was a, a majestic prophet, a mighty man of God. But many a times we forget that for two years and some, this man, for about two years, he walked around the bum of the town, the butt of everybody's jokes, a complete lunatic in the eyes of men. And yet, it was part of his assignment. <laughs> As you go back to those situations and circumstances, any shame or stigma, any awkwardness that is lingering from the time of fallout, the time of disagreement, or the time that they attacked your personality, any such thing, I declare it falling off of you now in the mighty name of Jesus. I want you to see now with a new set of eyes that every one of those things was part of your assignment. The Bible says that the man of God Isaiah was made to walk around naked as a sign unto the people of Israel. So all of what they called you out on was a sign unto them. But you, because you were not told and you were not aware, what you got out of it was the awkwardness and the shame. And the Lord is sending you back to the same place because now he wants to restore the glory. You will speak life to that man. You will prophesy to that situation. You will revisit those moments in your thoughts. You see, some of you, when you were supposed to have prophesied, Father, forgive them, for they knew not what they do. What you did was you insulted people and you cast them out. That was your opportunity to prophesy forgiveness and life and mercy, but you chose to, to speak verdict of judgment and condemnation. The Lord says, I'm giving you an opportunity right now, even where you're sitting down in your mind, begin to undo the curses. Begin to speak life, begin to prophesy. Because Jesus could have cursed the man who nailed him to the cross. 
But he looked up to the father and he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And the Lord is saying, I am bringing you the same opportunity again today because you are my watchman and I don't want anyone trying to pull you down because of some past mistake or missed opportunity. I want you to rectify it now. I give you the power to. Undo the trauma. Speak life. Speak life to that abuser and say, Father, forgive him for he knew not what he does. Speak life to those who took advantage of you. Even in your mind right now, I told you before, you are a multidimensional human being. You are not just in today. You can be in yesterday if you need to. You can be in tomorrow if you need to because Jesus says, as I am, so are you. And he is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He has given you that grace that is a transport system for you to be able to rectify that which has been broken and to salvage that which has been lost. You have work to do. I have work to do. We have a mission to carry out to alert others of the times that we are in so that people will not fall for the traps of Satan. We have too many zombies. We have more than enough zombies. We don't need another soldier falling and becoming one of them. And how are we going to do that? We will do that by prophesying. By the word of the Lord. From your mouth, many will be healed and restored. So for those of you who are standing... You are like a loaded gun in the hand of the Lord right now and he's aiming you at those situations to bring down the enemy that got glorified because of your laxity. You see, because that time that you bowed away from the situation, the enemy took that glory. And the Lord is saying now, you will cause that same enemy to fall by your obedience. And the name of your heavenly father will be glorified. The Lord says, I am love and love wins. Commit to me and commit to singing love, overcome. Now every single one of us, let us break bread. If you would turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Exodus chapter 11 verse 12. We will read that one verse of scripture. Even if we don't get to explain it very much. But we're just going to read it as we break bread. Today, as we receive of the Lord's body and drink of his blood. Exodus chapter 12 verse 11, sorry. The Bible says, and thus, Exodus chapter 12, verse 11. It says, and thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist. <clears throat> your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. So shall you eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. I want to point out a couple of things to us. Because this thing has been on my heart for a while, but I'm thankful to God that this is the day that the Lord has chosen to share this with you. We're called Communion House because the last thing God wants for us is to ever forget. That was why the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the primary introduction of the Holy Spirit was that he will bring to your remembrance. Because what is the point of saving you with an outstretched arm yesterday if by today you have forgotten? Because then I would have to do it again. Whereas you are now supposed to go save other people as I have saved you. But if you keep forgetting that you're saved, then I have to keep doing it again. We will not make progress. And that is the reason why he gave you the Holy Spirit so that you don't forget. And Jesus said, as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. Eat of my flesh. Drink of my blood. And thank God for the faithfulness that we continue to show here at Communion House. At breaking bread at every meeting that we have. As much as we can. But it's not just enough for us to do it. We have to do it right. And in these last days, the way we have communion is this. It says, you shall eat it, which is the Passover lamb. In case you don't know what Exodus 12 is about. Exodus 12 is about the lamb that was slaughtered. You know, the slaughter, the, the, the lamb to put the blood on their doorpost and, 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 uh, and on their uh, doors so that the angel of death will pass them by, right? That was the separation of the wheat from the tears at that exodus. Another separation is upon us that officially began late 2019 into 2020. We're seeing it in our world. There's a separation of those who believe from those who are just religious. We're seeing it, and for the final step of that separation until a new dispensation comes, 
You have to eat the Passover the same way. There are no two ways to it. This was how Lot and his family ate the Passover when they were getting driven out of Sodom and Gomorrah. Everything was done speedily. They were not even allowed to take anything. Everything was happening quickly. And so this, as much as it seems like it's dragged for so long, things have been sped up. And the Lord is saying, I want you to eat the Passover as though things have been sped up. So what do you do? You put your belt on your waist. What is your belt? The truth. When you go to Ephesians, it tells you how to put on the whole armor of God. And it tells you that you need to guard your loins with the belt of truth. Because the moment that truth is taken away from you, your nakedness is exposed. You have shame. So because you know that belt is what is holding the glory in place, you don't let anybody take the truth from you. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Do not compromise on what you know by God to be true. Even if the news says it a million times that it isn't true. Even if your friends have labeled you conspiracy theorist and silenced all your comments and messages, do not let go of the truth. It has to be on your waist at all times. And then it says your sandals have to be on your feet. What are your sandals? In the old armor of God, your sandals represent what? The preparation of the gospel of truth. When we were growing up, we were once told that it was the preaching of the gospel of truth. And so we will go around and preach the gospel, which is great and nothing wrong with it. But it is the preparation. How are you preparing yourself to be the gospel? How are you preparing yourself to learn how to squash anger so that you can continue to demonstrate the character of God simply because the ground upon which you stand is holy. That sandal is meant to be on. And the Bible says in your hand, you have to have a staff. Mm -hmm. you have to have a staff in your hand. You know what a staff is to the believer? It's that personal revelation that God has given to you because that's what you will have to lean on when the time comes. You know, Peter was the champion of personal revelation at the time of Jesus. And when Jesus was leaving, he said, the time is coming when you would need a staff to lean on and another will guide you. And he was not just telling him what's going to happen in a negative way, but he was letting him know that that revelation that he has started with is what he will end his life with. You will have a word of God to depend on. Even when you cannot see, it will lead you. This is how I am having my bread today, folks, because it is the Lord's Passover. I am having it, not letting my heart relent on whatever it is that I believe to be true, even if everything around me suggests otherwise. You may have pain in your body, but the truth says that the Lord is the healer. I am not going to let go of my confidence in the rock of my salvation. He is the healer. Even if I have symptoms of whatever, he is the healer. So as we break bread today, I would encourage us as much of, as many of us as can stand. Hazel, you can sit. But for the rest of us, if we can stand, let us stand. If you're a nursing grandpa in the back too, you can sit. Emmanuel, please sit. It's not very good when you play keyboard standing. But the rest of us, as we stand, I want you to say of the Lord, he is my refuge. Father, we thank you because you are our shield an exceeding great reward. As we eat of your body today, Jesus, and drink of your blood, we do so in remembrance of you. We remember the word that you said to us that we should wait in Jerusalem until we have received the blessing of the Father. We have received your grace, Jesus, because those disciples, you had already briefed on them and you said to them, receive the Holy Ghost. But they hadn't received the grace of the Father, which is the Holy Spirit that is coming from on high. And Jesus says, wait until you have received both. You have mine. Now you need to receive that of the Father. Because again, it is the grace of the Father and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, when you want the two, you have to wait. And they waited in Jerusalem until the day of Pentecost. Father, as we partake of your body today, Jesus, as we drink of your blood, we receive you yet again and we wait to receive the blessing from on high. In the mighty name of Jesus, you may eat and you may drink.
Praise the Lord. This is going to be very quick. I'm going to be handing over to the guys who will do the announcements and the offering. But there are seven things. Because we need wisdom. There are seven things very quickly that I want us to make. I want you to declare this from your mouth. Seven things. And you will thank God later. Or maybe you should even thank God now for those seven things. Thing number one is this. I will open my eyes and tell the Lord what I see. So that is the first one. I will open my eyes and tell the Lord what I see. Very quickly, the Lord wants to calibrate some of y'all's vision. Remember the blind man that Jesus touched his eyes with the clay? He spat into the sand, into the, into the mud, and rubbed it on his eyes. He says, what do you see? That one says, I see men walking as trees. If he had just gone away, that might be all the vision that he had. But he told the Lord what he saw, and the Lord was like, okay, there's more. And then the Lord perfected his healing, and he was able to see clearly. You need to exercise yourself in the things of God. Your senses are sharpened by the reason of use. Hazel, tell the Lord what you see. If what you see looks like pain, tell him. I say, Lord, this is what I see. And let him perfect that which concerns you. So I will open my eyes and I will tell the Lord what I see. The second thing is this. Lord, I will be on my knees and I will pray. Praise the Lord. And not faint. I will pray and I will not faint. So those two have already addressed Jesus' commands when he says watch and pray. Open your eyes, tell him what you see because he wants to perfect your vision and your discernment. Secondly, many of us, we only pray until we're tired. Once we're tired, we we'll stop praying. There are people you have stopped praying for because you're tired. There are things you have stopped addressing because you are tired. But the Bible says it is the prayer of faith that heals the sick. What is the prayer of faith? A prayer that continues until you have the substance from another dimension. It is the substance of things hoped for. So until you have that substance, let me tell you something. For many people here who may not know what it means, when the Bible says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, what that means is you need to have conscious thoughts in hope and confidence in God of the things that he has promised until you can pick up from when, wherever you leave off. And what that means is when you think about what God is doing in your life and you keep imagining the fulfillment of promise, you go to bed and you wake up and you can pick up from wherever you leave off. That thing has become substance. You understand what I mean? Because you know sometimes you're like, oh, I can't even remember. How do I even feel about that? No, you don't have faith just yet. You have faith wherein the reality that you have engaged in your mind is so tangible that you can always go back to where you left off. You see those things. You see your blessing being delivered. You see your child behaving right. To the point wherein when you have conversations with that troublesome child in your mind, they are speaking the mind of God consistently. Now you have substance of what you hope for. Until you have faith like that, you are not done praying. Because it takes the prayer of faith, a prayer that has substance. So I will kneel, I will pray, and not faint. The third one, and I'm going to wrap up on this one. This third one is very simple. Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. So your default setting, Sister Z, is that you know his voice. So if for some reason now I am not sure, it is not because I stopped knowing it, it's because I have come to know other things and they're competing for my attention. I want you to say, Lord, I profess you and I deny the world. I deny every other voice. I glorify only your voice in my heart. Oh, please bear with me, Manuel. I need to finish the seven because I was going to stop at three because I was looking at the time. You see, it is very critical. These seven things were handed to me by God because we need wisdom with which to navigate in the season that we're in. I tell you what, you 
know his voice. Because Jesus will not lie. He says, I'm the good shepherd and my sheep know my voice. So why am I confused now? I'm confused because I've entertained another voice. And Jesus says, the voice of another, they will not entertain. So how did I get here? Because I gave in. Okay, I'm the one who gave in to those voices, those passions. Now I'm giving them up because I have the power to choose between life and death. Now I choose life. Thing number four. Is that number three? Yeah. Thing number four is this. The word of God says, I am above always and not beneath. The Lord is getting ready to turn it all around. Everything that has been above you is about to be beneath you. So just think about how, foundation, how your foundation, how robust is going to be. The extent to which you have been opposed by the enemy is the extent to which you will have land to tread upon. And so this is the confession. Praise the Lord. So this is the confession. The confession is this. I will wait until my change comes. I will depend on God's ability and not my ability. I will patiently wait for his hand to move and to turn things around. By so doing, what do you have? You have peace. Thing number five, I want you to take a look at your hand and say, Father, you have given me this hand to do your work. The work of you who has sent me. You've designed it specifically for my assignment. And so I speak to this hand. Come out. Of wherever you have been into your assignment. Even if you've been enjoying that little dish that your hand is in, the Lord is saying, Let your hand come out now. So speak to your hand and say, Hand, I redeem you by the blood of the Lamb, because Jesus already paid for you to do the work of Him who has sent you. The significance of that is with the time that we have left. We will not be wasteful. We will not waste time. We will not waste passion. We will not waste strength. But we will be effective in the things that are pleasing to our Heavenly Father. In the mighty name of Jesus. And then number six. I hear it like I heard your clap. The Lord said to me to let you know that you have to say with your mouth. Let them come home. Every prodigal that is in your life is time for them to come home. Speak for them to come home. Come home. Every prodigal come home. There is a man of God that I know that is very close to me. But he's been a prodigal because his heart has followed after the things of the world because of the cares of this life. I speak to you today. Come home. You're a priest of righteousness. Come home. You see, because some of my comrades are not yet standing where they need to stand. And I just don't like the fact that I know that we're open on the east. And we're open right there in the southwest. Because the men who are supposed to be there are still eating with pigs. Prodigal. Come home. No man that is at war entangles himself with the affairs of this world. Prodigal. Come home. We're not going to judge you. Just come. Uh, we're going to celebrate you. Just come. We will receive you with open arms. Just come. And lastly, I want you to say this with great confidence in the Lord. I refuse to lose my peace. Jesus paid such a price for you to be at peace. And he wants you to partner with him. You know, if I give you something, I need that. I can give you this Bible and then you can just let it fall to the ground. I can't help you hold it. Because if I'm still holding it, then I haven't given it to you. And God has freely given you all things. What does that mean? No strings attached. I'm not giving you that Bible and tying a rope to my hand so that it doesn't fall. So for it to remain in your hand, it's up to you to hold on to it. Hold on to the profession of your faith. And so the Lord Jesus has given you peace. See, I say that I refuse to lose my peace. It doesn't matter the agitation, I just refuse. I say, not today. I am not losing my peace. I refuse 
to lose my peace. In the mighty name of Jesus. The Lord is with you in your going out and in your coming in. You know I love you with all of my heart. And we will fight until we see the coming of the Son of Man and the blue skies. Come in to give to each and every one of us according to the work of our hands. We will not miss our reward in the mighty name of Jesus. Communion House, keep fighting the good fight. Pray. Like your life depends on it. Your belt is the truth. Your sandals is your character. That you are being prepared by God and that you are preparing to showcase to the world the gospel of righteousness. God bless you. What an on time word, huh? God is good. God is good. So for uh, tithing and offering details, uh, you can make your eyes to the screen. Um, dollar sign at Communion House. Uh, so definitely have the given details on the screen there. Um, and God is just so great. And I, I think we all need to listen to this message seven times for obvious reasons. Um, so would everybody please uh, bow their heads, close their eyes. Father God, we just thank you for another awesome day. We just thank you for just delivering an on-time word that can resonate with our spirits and our hearts, Father. We thank you for just being so faithful and just blessing us with the ability to understand your word and allowing it to resonate with us. And Father, we just ask that these uh, tithings, tithes and offerings be lifted up in your name. And we just praise you, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. So uh, there we go. So for details for the week announcements, you know, we've got Tuesday. We've got the, uh, our normal uh, meeting hours with dinner and uh, praise and worship at 6.30 p.m. And then Wednesday, we've got watch night service uh, on via Instagram, um, watch night prayer. Uh, that's at 9 p.m. on Communion House uh, Instagram page. And then lastly, Saturday, we back at it again, 6.30 p.m. Let's do it, y'all. God is good. Love y'all. Praise God. Oh, that's okay. That sounds good. God is good. <laughs> Let's celebrate our dear brother Chris. God is good. We're thankful for him. What a night tonight, a night of impartation. Let's take this and run with it. Amen. God is good. Father, we thank you for this time of fellowship of what you've done in this house, in our midst, meeting with us. So oh God, speaking through your prophet, we declare indeed that we receive the enablement to do what you have called us to do. Father, we give you praise for traveling mercies as we go back home, as we let this word stir up within us, that we indeed also shall take this presence to our households and all that are a part of it shall experience it as well. We declare that all glory and honor belong to you. And we all said, amen. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the Lord. God is good. Everyone have a blessed night.